Okay, welcome back. Our next presenter, Seth Weedman, senior data scientist at Facebook, works on machine learning problems related to their data centers. Prior to Facebook, he taught data science for Metis, both as part of their immersive boot camp program and directly to companies as a founding member of the corporate training team. He started out in data science at Trunk Club as the first member of the data science team, building lead scoring models and recommender systems. Prior to that, he worked in management consulting. A frequent conference speaker, he is passionate about breaking down advanced ML concepts and making them more understandable. He is the author of book, Deep Learning from Scratch, forthcoming from O'Reilly in November 2019. He has undergraduate degrees in mathematics and economics from University of Chicago. Please welcome Seth Weedman. Hi, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Great. So just to make sure everybody's in the right place, uh, since this is a finance conference, I won't be making any predictions on Facebook's stock price during this talk. Um, nor will I be talking about Libra. So, you know, if that's what you're interested in, you can uh, go to the other room. Okay, cool. What I will be doing is talking about uh, time series modeling and talking about why you might want to consider using uh, recurrent neural networks for time series and how that technique differs from some of the classical time series methods you might be more familiar with. So, we'll start out just by reviewing what the classical time series techniques are and then talk about why you might want to use RNNs and then talk about some caveats with using RNNs, and also some myths. You might have heard that they're not really interpretable, and so on and so forth. So I'll talk about why that might not be as true as you might think. And then finally, for those of you that are really into the, deep into the AI field, I'll talk about some comparisons between RNNs and some really bleeding edge uh, deep learning techniques that have come out. All right, so classical time series. So what is like, the classical, the setting for the classical uh, time series problem and modeling techniques. Basically, you have some thing that's varying over time, and you want to predict what it's going to do in the future. So like this is a log log plot of the price of Bitcoin. Um, so you might want to predict just based on this information alone, based on the fluctuations and whether it's gone up or down, just based on this, just on the univariate time series, whether it will go up or down in the future. And classical time series techniques actually handle this right well, uh, very well. So like ARIMA models that many of you may be familiar with. They basically look at, so what is the effect of the last P time steps, last uh, some number of time steps on the future? So you can take all your past data on Bitcoin data and say, when the price went up six days prior, five days prior, four days prior, whatever, what effect did that have on whether the price went up or down in the future? And you can assume that that same pattern will hold uh, going forward and build a model to just looks at the price of Bitcoin in the past and tries to predict the price of Bitcoin in the future. There's an MA component in these models, which essentially assumes that the past trend can be broken down into some underlying trend and then deviations from that trend, and then says, what was the correlation between the deviations from that trend and the future price of Bitcoin? So for example, when there was a positive deviation in the trend, did that cause the price to go up the next day or down the next day? And so on for the last several days. And you can do all this on difference data. So you can not just look at the actual price of Bitcoin, you can look at the change in the price of Bitcoin or the change in the change of the price of Bitcoin. So this is sort of what classical time series is. And this works really well for a variety of problems. So the, uh, I'll actually be talking a lot about, um, I'll be using a lot of examples from Uber, which I think is the tech company that does time series stuff uh, in the most sophisticated way uh, of any company I've seen out there and, and at least publishes most about it. And the reason is because their entire business is based on time series modeling. Literally, the entire company is a big time series modeling problem. What will demand be in the next minute, hour, et cetera? Um, or as Facebook does more like classification problems. Um, but the only sort of Facebook plug I'll make is for this library called Facebook Profit, which some of you may have used or heard of. But it essentially does all that ARIMA stuff for you. You literally give it uh, you know, a CSV or a Pandas data frame or something uh, of time series values in the past and it figures out the correct ARIMA model to build for you. And it does some other clever stuff, like it automatically accounts for whether there's holidays in your, t in your time series and treats those differently, and it automatically adds in seasonality and figures out good ways to handle that. Um, and it's just an open source tool. Facebook uh, Core Machine Learning open sourced it in middle of 2017. So definitely check that out. 
But what are some downsides of this classical time series stuff? So first, like a minor limitation, by default, it only looks at linear relationships, right? So it only looks at linear relationships between those AR, MA components, basically past behavior and future behavior. And this can be overcome with some feature engineering. You can manually do stuff to try to look at nonlinear relationships. But the major limitation is that by default, and again, you can overcome this manually in some ways, and I'll talk about ways you can do this, but you can't handle exogenous features. And in finance in particular, so a lot of time series problems, if you're just trying to detect an anomaly or something, you don't, this isn't that important. But in finance, this is incredibly important because everything is interconnected. If you're trying to predict the price of some stock, you might want to throw into your model the price of a bunch of other stocks, the price of commodities, uh, a whole bunch of other factors that you all probably know a lot more about um, than I do. And um, so, you know, if you're trying to predict the price of Bitcoin, you might want to throw in, I don't know, some characteristic about the S&P 500, um, some like index of sentiment out there about Bitcoin from scraping news articles, uh, the price of Ethereum, the price of other cryptocurrencies, and so on and so forth. And um, so you can do this. You can incorporate these features as external regressors, right? Like essentially classical time series techniques are a big regression. So you can include these as other factors in your regression. Uh, but again, you have the same limitations as, with, as uh, with classical time series without exogenous features. Basically, by default, you only look at linear relationships between these past, uh, these, these exogenous features uh, and the actual thing you're trying to predict. And in particular, and another thing is they don't by default capture the relationship between combinations of these features and um, the actual thing you're trying to predict. So like taking Bitcoin as an example, you might imagine that if the price of Ethereum, there might not be a big correlation between if the price of Ethereum increases and whether the price of Bitcoin increases. And similarly, there might not be a big correlation between Bitcoin sentiment and if the price of Bitcoin in uh, increases. You know, that might not be a strong enough signal. But there might be a really strong signal if the price of Ethereum drops and Bitcoin sentiment increases, that might predict that price of Bitcoin will increase the next day. So you want to be able, you want to have a model that can learn these kind of combinations of features that can actually predict your target. All right, so RNNs, or recurrent neural networks, are one solution to this. So let's dig into first high level, um, what are they? I'll give this description that won't entirely make sense, um, but then I'll dive into a visual on, uh, on what they are. And actually, uh, let me just get a quick pulse on the room. Who here feels like they could, like, who here feels like they could, right now, I won't make you do it, but you could stand up and give a decent explanation of what a neural network is? Who here feels that way? Okay, cool, about a third or a quarter of the room. Who here feels like they could do this for RNNs, recurrent neural networks? Okay, not very many people. Cool, okay, good. So this will be a good overview for, for those of you that aren't familiar. So what RNNs do and how they handle time series is they take in data from a sequence of time steps and sort of process them sequentially. So they'll take in all the data from this time step, process it, and I'll talk about a little bit about that means in the next slide. Um, and then they update sort of the state of all the variables in the, uh, they, they have a vector that captures the state of all the variables in your, in, your, um, in your model. So you could think of if you fed in a bunch of market factors at your first time step, the hidden state of the recurrent neural network at the next time step would be like some, some vector that represents the market uh, conditions of your model. Then you feed that into the next time step and that, that vector of the market conditions gets updated by the, the features at that time step. And then this thing sort of continually gets updated. And by processing data sequentially, recurrent ne neural networks can make much better predictions than the classical techniques. And I'll dive in, I'll break this down more in the next couple slides. So yeah, they do this uh, sequential processing of data by storing an internal hidden state that incorporates all the data they've seen in the past. And the most common variant of RNNs is called LSTMs. You might have heard of this. Um, they work in almost exactly the same way as RNNs, uh, the only difference being the specific things they do at each time step to process the data. And the details of that you can go read about. It's mathy or whatever, and sort of most li libraries you'll use that do this just handle all that for you. So I don't think that's the most important thing. The most important thing is to understand this sequential processing thing. So the next couple slides will do a visual of RNNs and then a visual of classical techniques, and you'll sort of see how they compare. So here's kind of how RNNs work. You start out by feeding some vector in to your RNN. 
that, represent, that, that represents all your features at, say, time step one. So this could be, let's say you're trying to predict the price of Bitcoin um, you know, tomorrow. And you start out by, let's just say, feeding in features from one week ago. So you feed in a vector that's like the price of Bitcoin a week ago, the S&P 500, some characteristic about the S&P 500 a week ago, the price of Ethereum, the sentiment about Bitcoin, et cetera. Feed that into your RNN. And in addition, you initialize your RNN with some hidden state. And this hidden state thing is usually just initialized to some random numbers. Then what happens is your RNN sees your, the values of your features and does some math to sort of process them and then returns an updated hidden state. And this updated hidden state, again, if you're feeding in market features, market conditions, this updated hidden state can be thought of as the RNN's representation of the market conditions um, at, after seeing the data from the first time step. Then, you, so you have this updated hidden state, then you feed in the values of the features from the next time step, from the next day. So you feed in the price of Bitcoin not a week ago, but six days ago, price of Ethereum six days ago, some S&P conditions from six days ago, et cetera, et cetera. The RNNC is, okay, given that I saw conditions you know, from seven days ago seven, uh, first, then I saw conditions from six days ago, it updates its hidden state again. And sort of, now it has a hidden state that's like, um, that represents, and it captures information about the sequence of time steps that it's seen, um, not just the individual data it saw from that time step. And you can keep going in this way and eventually, you feed in the values of, let's say, all these features today and get a prediction on what the, what the price of Bitcoin will be um, tomorrow based on the fact that it's seen the following sequence of market conditions over the last week. And that's sort of at a high level how RNNs work. Um, and you can train all this using just lots and lots of training data. So feed in past, let's say, week-long sequences of data and see how a series of market conditions affected the price of Bitcoin at the end of that week, for example. All right, so what do classical time series methods do? Classical time series methods basically do the following. Um, they can, you, can, you can feed in all the same information, all these features about the market and, and all this stuff from, from, the prior, from the prior week, for example. Um, but you basically feed them into a single model and this model can be very sophisticated and so on, but you feed them into a single model and you get out a prediction of the price of Bitcoin on day n plus one. So this can work decently well, but um, you know, it doesn't have this notion of sequential processing of data. And in fact, in, in particular, it's very hard to encode any notion of order here. So like, let's just say you were looking at the last three days of data. You know, an RNN could learn something like if the market conditions sort of go down for two days and then increase for a day, that means that the price of Bitcoin is going to increase on day number four. Whereas classical time series methods would have a hard time sort of encoding the fact that there's this se specific series of actions that happened in a particular order in the past. So that's why, for example, um, you know, companies that really rely on time series at a deep level are starting to use these techniques. So some caveats with RNNs, like actual, actual caveats. The first two are just that um, they do require a lot of data, because basically neural networks and RNNs in general are learning really complex patterns uh, between inputs and outputs. And to learn all those patterns, you need a lot of training data. You need a lot of examples of here was all this financial data, things that happened in the past, and here's what happened in the future. And you just need lots and lots of different um, scenarios that the RNN has seen so it can detect what's going to happen in the future. And this is sort of a quote from the Uber blog, RNNs have been shown to be very useful if sufficient data, and also RNNs are really good at handling these exogenous regressors, which just means extra features that are related to the thing you're trying to predict but aren't actually that thing. So here's an interesting thing with RNNs. Um, you've probably heard that neural networks aren't very interpretable, right? Um, and that's a, that's a common sentiment. And it is true that if you're trying to figure out why did my RNN predict the price of Bitcoin would increase the next day, um, it's not clear because there's a bunch of just very complicated and in particular interrelated mathematical things happening that are causing the prediction to be whatever it is. But it's actually really easy to just do sort of what if analyses with RNNs. So in particular, 
with the price of Bitcoin example, you could just feed into your RNN, okay, I see that you looked at the last week of data and you predicted the price of Bitcoin is going to go up. But what if I took out the data that was fed into the RNN and instead uh, fed in data that should, like what if the price of Ethereum had decreased over the last week? Um, or what if Bitcoin sentiment had gone down over the last week? You could just feed that data into your RNN and see how its prediction would have changed. So it's very easy to just sort of change the data that's fed in and see how the RNN changes its, changes its prediction or changes its behavior. So it's very easy to do like what if analyses with RNNs. And this is something uh, Uber does a lot. And in particular, um, I saw a talk from this guy who talked about they do this to predict um, rider behavior and driver behavior in the future and how it will respond to different incentives or promotions. They just say, okay, we know we trained an RNN and we have a, a model that explains, you know, how many promotions we were doing and how many trips riders took. So they can say, okay, what if we increase that number of promotions? Feed that data into the RNN and get a prediction on how many trips riders will take. What if we decrease the level of promotions? Feed that in, get a prediction on how many uh, trips riders will take, et cetera, et cetera. And there's links here also, like you can go read these blog posts. Um, these are all public, by the way. So yeah, you can, so RNNs aren't like interpretable in terms of knowing exactly what's going on, but they're uh, interpretable in terms of being able to do what if analyses, which in finance is something you might want to do quite a bit. Another interesting thing is um, a lot of times what you want to do with time series prediction is get confidence intervals. So you don't just want to know what is the price of Bitcoin or some stock going to be tomorrow. You want to know, like, are you really sure that it's going to be that price or is there a really big confidence interval around that? Like, is there, is there, am I really uncertain? And there's been some really interesting just cutting edge stuff around that uh, using Bayesian deep learning techniques. And essentially, the steps are that you just um, take your RNN, and these RNNs are made up of these series of nodes, as it turns out. Um, each one of those circles that processes the data at each time step has like a number of nodes. And essentially, what, uh, and there's a, uh, I talk on the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll show where this comes from, but they came up with this technique that's like you, you essentially randomly drop out subsets of these nodes. So you randomly take out different nodes from your RNN and see how much its predictions vary as a result. So maybe it's the case that if you take out some of your RNN's predictive power, it makes the exact same prediction. And if so, then you're pretty con then you have a low confidence interval. Then you're pretty confident that your RNN is actually predicting something accurately. But if you take out certain nodes in it um, and it widely varies its predictions, then you know that it actually isn't very confident and you have a wide confidence interval. And uh, this is, um, you know, for anybody who's done an internship, this will make you feel, including me, like this will make you feel really lousy. An intern at Uber did this um, as her summer project. Uh, you know, at Uber, probabilistic time series forecasting is used for robust prediction of number of trips. So basically, um, she figured out how to, uh, she was like, yep, classical techniques don't work very well for us. So we came up with a novel end-to-end LSTM-based Bayesian deep learning model that provides time series prediction along with uncertainty estimation. This model has been successfully applied to large-scale time series anomaly detection at Uber. Um, so, and she's published a few of these papers, but then she stopped publishing, and I looked up her LinkedIn to find out why. She's now a quantitative researcher at Two Sigma. So, you know, <laughs> unlike Uber, I, I assume they're actually quite profitable. So uh, <laughs> they're, um, you know, they probably paid her a lot. I don't know. Yep. Cool. So. I don't know if any of you have, this is for the few people in the room that have been like maybe reading uh, the bleeding edge of what's going on with sequential prediction and deep learning. Who here's heard of like transformer models or anything like that? Okay, one, <laughs> three hands, three hands, cool. Um, so there have been models that purport to do even better than RNNs that have come out that are like really bleeding edge. Um, and in particular, they do, RNNs have traditionally also been used for language modeling, um, for like language translation. So Google Translate um, has used LSTMs and RNNs to, to power Google Translate. There's been models called transformers using uh, multi-headed attention that have done better than these in the, in like the last couple of years. Um, but the problem with these techniques is most of them aren't auto-regressive. So most of them are actually doing something called sequence to sequence. So they're taking in an English sentence as input, like a full sentence, and producing a full sentence in Spanish or French or whatever as output. And it turns out they do that better than LSTMs can. 
but what you need for time series prediction is you need a model that can take in a series of time steps and predict what's going to happen in the next time step, and then take in that and then say what's going to happen in the next time step, et cetera. So that's called, those are called autoregressive models, um, where you just, you're just actually predicting the next time step. So lately, there have been some models that have come out that are actually really bleeding edge that are, in fact, autoregressive, but none of them have been used successfully for time series so far. It's still just LSTMs that are used um, most successfully. And I think part of the intuition for why is like you do need a ton of data to train um, an RNN effectively. I assume, you know, in finance, I, I would imagine that's a scenario where you would have that much data. But um, um, I think like these new models, these language models, are actually even bigger than RNNs and LSTMs and require even more data. And they're trained on like massive corpora of language data, like all of Wikipedia. So I think maybe. Um, even though you need a lot of, even though like Uber has a ton of data to train an RNN, they might not have enough data to train one of these more advanced models. And also, like there are still a lot of bleeding edge things happening in deep learning. You might have heard that uh, you know, DeepMind and OpenAI are now training these AIs that can play video games better than the best humans, even really, really complex video games that require coordination between players and so on. And the core technology powering these AIs is LSTMs. It's not um, these transformers or these more advanced things. All right, that's all I've got. So happy to stick around for questions. Yes, right there. You mentioned uh, large data cryptically a couple of times. Yeah. Can you get less cryptic than that, or is it kind of use case by use case? I think it's use case by use case. Um, so your question is how big, the question behind the question, I think, is how big does your data really need to be? Um, to train an RNN, or to use an RNN as opposed to some classical time series technique. Um, it is use case by use case. I can't say for sure. Um, but I don't know. I mean, if you have data on a bunch of different market factors, for example, and their values every minute, um, which I imagine, or every day at least, that I imagine, I imagine some of you have access to, I think, and, and you have years of that data, then that's going to be enough for an RNN to pick up on patterns. Like, if the, these fo following things happen in the last four days, then on day five, this is going to happen, or it's more likely to happen than it would be at random. I think that's, I think that's going to be enough. So I think um, probably I would say most companies that don't have a super time series centric product probably don't have enough data to do this, but I imagine finance is one of the key use cases for this. So my, I, I do not have any data to back this up at all, but I would imagine lots of hedge funds are at least trying to do this, right? I don't know. I could be wrong. Two sigma is at least, yeah. I'll get to you. Five minutes? Okay. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. There are certain use cases such as financial crime modeling in which mm. uh, the true positive rate is extremely low. Mm -hmm. So in that case, clearly LSTM or RNN would not work. Yep. Would you have any insight what statistical model would work in such cases where there's very true, very little true positive data to train the model? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, he asked, what about financial crime, where you're trying to, you might have millions of transactions and a tiny number of them are actually crime related. And I think there you would probably use more traditional classification techniques. Um, such as random forests and gradient boosted trees, sort of your tree-based machine learning models, or even just normal feed-forward neural networks, so not even recurrent neural networks. Because recurrent neural networks are really good if you have a sequence of actions, and then you're trying to predict what's going to happen next given the sequence that you've seen. And financial crime might be like, I just saw one thing happen, and I think that's a transaction that's fraudulent or that's that could be related to crime. So unless you have a sequence of things that you're trying to use to detect that some kind of crime is happening, um, you might not even need an RNN. You might just need classical, normal, normal machine learning techniques. And in terms of which specific algorithm you would use if you have like a really small number of positives, um, any of these algorithms can work OK if you have a small number of positives uh, either out of the box or if you do some tweaks like upsampling the positive class or down, upsampling the positive class or downsampling the negative class. Basically, you know, if one in a million transactions is fraudulent, you could just randomly sample one in every hundred of the non-fraudulent non ones and then build a model based on that data set, uh, for example. Does that make sense? 
Cool. And then, did you have a question there in the back, or are you just telling me that? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to get to you because you had your hand up a while ago. They are not regulated, right? But uh, if, if, for example, traditional banks want want to use it, we we need we are regulated, and we need to have like very good reasons. For are you aware of any any techniques or any research that that kind of act can actually open mm -hmm. that particular hidden state and give some sort of a view about what exactly how much memory is being captured and. Or in other words, like my question is that like uh, explaining your predictions using RNNs is is that uh, something that you yeah. focus on? Yeah. Uh, so the question is about just explaining RNN models in scenarios where you're dealing with a really regulated uh, uh, situation. So yeah, this is an active area of research, and um, the guy from Zest Finance yesterday, who's a big lender. Um, gave a talk on how they do a lot of stuff to figure out with their machine learning models um, what led to someone being denied a car loan or denied a bank loan or something like that, because they have to, because they're in a regulated industry. Um, with RNN specifically, I don't know of any techniques that are specific to RNN explainability or, or interpretability. I think, though, um, the real use case of RNNs, again, is like prediction, time series prediction. and um, at least based on the talk yesterday, I think the major use cases of uh, where you need a really interpretable model are use cases where you'd use a traditional machine learning model and not necessarily use an RNN. Because like, if you're trying to predict, um, well, I don't, maybe I'm, I'm wrong about this, but I imagine if you're just trying to predict what's going to happen in the next week with the stock market, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that's as much something you need to explain to regulators as if you're lending, if you're giving out credit card loans and you deny some people and don't deny others, you need to explain why you denied some people. Um, so I don't know of any, to directly answer your question, I don't know of any techniques that, are, that deal with explainability for RNNs in particular, but it's very, very well studied for other machine learning algorithms that might be applied to regulated industries. Hi, uh, yeah. Art, Art Wang Farawang from US Bank. Of, uh, Quick question: um, cool. What, how, how do RNNs work when the interval is not regular for the data points? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I, that that I think RNNs generally. So there's different things you could do. You know, let's say you had, um, you know, data you were trying to data you were, you were trying to make a prediction every hour, right? But sometimes you had data for every hour, and sometimes you had data every minute or something. Um, you know, you could hack something that might work, might work like the following. If you have three hours of data missing, you could just input the last hour for which you have data as the data for those three hours. Or you could linearly interpolate between this hour and this hour and just assume that the features um, uh, linearly interpolate. So you're right. That is, I mean, if data is missing in general with any machine learning problem, that's always a limitation. And there's things you could do to try to get around it that may or may not work. But um, yeah, that's. Um, you're absolutely right that that's sort of a, a limitation of, of these techniques. Yeah, and then I think you had a question. Yeah. yeah um, actually, I, I think it's a simple question. Sure. Uh, OK, um, so I mean, whatever you were discussing just yeah. now, it kind of you know, apparent that uh, RNN, uh, RNN works best when you have sequential or time series data. Yep. Uh, but it's not clear to me um, how the recent variations, like transformers and BART yeah. you talked about, they work for uh, language translation, which is the sequential nature of that is not really apparent to me. I mean, language translation, it's always yeah. the same, right? Yeah, um, the idea is like, to get into, like, it's a little off topic, but basically um, words are sequential, right? So you could say, like, given that I've seen I am a as the se sequence of words, the next word is probably not going to be piano or something. It's probably going to be I am a person or something like that. So yeah, uh, just that. Yeah. Are we at time? OK. All right, I'll stick around and answer questions for as long as people want. So thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it.